Local 4 News begins right now with a breaking news alert. We are following two breaking stories at this hour. First, live pictures from southwest Detroit where a woman's remains have been found in an alley. But we're going to begin with breaking news from Flint, where a judge has just dismissed all of the charges in the Mateen Cleave sexual assault case. Good to have you with us for Local 4 News at 5 on this Monday. It has been a headline grabbing case since the start. Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy brought in her A team to try and bring Mateen Cleaves to trial. And late this afternoon, the judge in a lengthy and highly emotional preliminary exam ruled there is no case after all. Rod Maloney has been following the case closely and joins us live from the newsroom with the latest. And Rod, this is is highly unusual here. Well, you know, Kimberly, prosecutors don't usually like to bring cases to court unless they're pretty certain that they can get a conviction, but this one never even got to trial. And it was marked by fiery courtroom theatrics and a pitched battle between Worthy's lead prosecutor, Lisa Lindsay, and Cleve's defense attorney, Frank Manley, with a weary judge, Kathy Dowd, trying to keep a lid on things all along. This afternoon, she ended the fight. I, I just don't believe there is enough probable cause for it to go over on false imprisonment. The false imprisonment charges against Cleves came tied to two third degree sexual conduct charges. Judge Dowd explained why she didn't believe the alleged victim's stories that Cleves twice dragged her back into the motel room to assault her after she ran out. I looked at the video again today and there is no doubt in my mind after viewing it what is going on. But Miss Lindsay says, I'm supposed to believe that he's pulling her back in the room to commit CSC. There are a number of factors that lead me to believe something else could be going on. There were still two more tougher sex charges, and the judge again found the alleged victim's testimony unconvincing. She also tells the nurse, I'm on hydrocodone and Motrin, and she danced all around that. And she danced all around whether that was her in the car at the front of the hotel. Well, you can assume it's me. No, I don't recognize the purse. No, I don't remember. Now, the alleged victim testified over two days about the situation. The judge is referring there to the back end of her testimony where she would not say that she was the person sitting in Mateen Clee's vehicle outside the hotel on the video that was shown from the night of the assault. The judge also said that it was the young woman who initiated the evening with Cleves and voluntarily left with Cleves and made no effort to get herself out of that situation. Back to you. Well, uh, any talk yet of appeal out of the prosecutor's uh, office of this decision? Devin, the way this case went, and as vociferously as Lisa Lindsay conducted this, you knew that Kim Worthy's office was going to want another bite at this apple. And in fact, they said in a news and in a press release this afternoon that they will, in fact, in the next 28 days, make sure that they appeal this case. Yeah. So this is far from finished. Got a month now to do that. All right, Rod. Also breaking right now, a woman's remains found in an alley in southwest Detroit. Let's bring in Coco McAvoy rather to tell us uh, live what's happened here. Coco. Devin and Kimberly, police are only identifying the victim as a white woman, but her body was found in this alleyway on Majestic and Central on the city's west side, and it was found in a plastic container. And we spoke to a neighbor, Ivory Carter, who's very troubled by this and says it's such a shame that something like this happened in her neighborhood. I was like, oh my God, who in the world could have a heart to do something like that? You know, that could have been my sister or it could have been my aunt or anybody. Ivory Carter has been living on Central Street for more than 20 years. And when she heard that a woman's body was found just up the street in a plastic container, she said she sadly wasn't surprised. It could be you next. You never know, you know, and it'd be dark. You can't see out here at night and it's dangerous out even in the daytime. You used to be scared at night, but you're scared in the daytime now. But her thoughts immediately went to the victim's family who will eventually get the bad news. It's really sad. My prayers go out to the family. I yeah, it's real. I hope they catch him. Yeah, it's real sad. Right now, officers don't have a motive or a suspect and are waiting for the medical examiner's office to identify the woman who was found. But Carter is hoping people will start banding together to stop the violence in the city of Detroit. And ain't no telling how long she was missing or where she even came from. You know, I just think that's just disgusting. 
You know, we need to, as people step up and try to make the city more safer. And my sources are telling me that there is no indication right now that the victim is the 28 year old woman who went missing from Farmington Hills, but they are waiting on confirmation of identity from the medical examiner's office. But if anyone knows anything about what happened here, you're asked to call the Detroit Police Department. Reporting live on the city's west side, I'm Coco McAvoy, Local 4. All right, Coco, a pilot and his passenger are okay after a rough landing at Oakland County Airport today. Sky 4 was there around 3.30 this afternoon when a small plane skid its way down the runway after circling the airport for nearly three hours there. And you can see coming up here, the plane's nose hitting the ground Ooh. as it landed kind of rough there. Officials say the plane's landing gear malfunctioned. Both the pilot and the passenger are okay. We'll have more on this emergency landing coming up on Local 4 News at 6. An investigation is underway in Clarkston after a restaurant caught fire there. Sky 4 was over the scene just after noon today as firefighters were working to put out the fire at the Lakes Grill on Dixie Highway. You see here really intense, thick smoke coming from the back of the restaurant. The fire is out at this hour. Uh, no word on any injuries, but nor is there any word yet on what started it. A mistrial was declared today and the murder trial of former South Carolina officer Michael Slager. Slager was charged with murder after shooting and killing unarmed Walter Scott after a traffic stop back in April of last year. The shooting had been captured on video. Today, the jury said they were unable to come to a unanimous decision. Slager was facing life in prison, but it's a mistrial. We'll see what happens now on take two, if there is one. Okay, we are roughly four and a half hours into the presidential recount in the state of Michigan. Only Oakland and Ingham counties have started so far. Uh, other counties scrambling to prepare to start tomorrow. Guy Gordon joins us from Oakland County. It is a huge undertaking. We talked about that last week, Guy, and now it's here. <laughs> Such an understatement, Devin. Yeah, 75 teams working hard at it right now. Now, here's the deal. The problem in Wayne County is this. Uh, before you start a recount, you've got to make sure that no one's added ballots into the boxes and that no one's taken any out. So they do a quick count with these. They open them up and they say, okay, does the number of ballots in the box match with the number of names on the poll book of people who voted. If it doesn't match, then there could be some shenanigans. So they're doing that first before they do the recount, and that's the problem in Wayne County. Some of the numbers don't match up. The ballots have been under seal since election night. They check the seal, then they break it, and then they count the total ballots. If the total doesn't match the total in the poll book, they count again. When Wayne County's vote was canvassed last month, one third of precincts had totals that did not match. But even if they aren't recounted, the votes are not rejected. Uh, if a precinct cannot be recounted, everyone in that precinct can rest assured that their vote was counted and it was part of the overall total. What that simply means is they're not going to recount that individual precinct. Then and only then do they sort. Once they are sorted by candidate, each pile is again counted and checked against the total. There is a December 13th deadline. The workers were instructed speed is not a goal. No, we're looking to be accurate. So will it cover all the costs in Oakland County? Probably not. Make sure there is no human error. Observers from each party can challenge at any time if a mark is unclear or a vote is questionable. Checking to make sure that the marks are within the confines of voting for the president and that they're consistent with the whole ballot. Need to find out if the election's crooked or not. Okay. My feeling is I don't believe it is. Okay. okay. But 10,000 votes isn't very much. Now, everything going smoothly here so far in Oakland County. This is an arduous process, we're told, down in Wayne County. Not to get too excited, an election official telling me that once they open the ballot boxes, many of these discrepancies could be reconciled. Now, they have been counting in the meantime. We should say that about 60 precincts have been completely counted out of, out of the 1,000 that they need to get done. And right now, Donald Trump is up 15 votes. Hillary Clinton is up nine, so a net gain so far for Donald Trump. And again, that's only with a few dozen precincts fully counted. It is ongoing. We do know of at least one precinct that was disqualified because there was not a book match. We are live from Waterford. I'm Guy Gordon, local for Devin and uh, Kimberly. Back to you. You know, Guy, any change is going to be troubling, even if it doesn't change the result, because it's going to mean to show to people that uh, we didn't get the count right in the first place. But given how enormous this is, as you've just outlined it for us, December 13th, what are the odds you can get to that? 
Well, uh, nobody is saying. I, I got to tell you, everybody's looking at this process and they're saying uh, it depends on the number of challenges. There haven't been a lot of challenges here. Yeah. Uh, but if you've got uh, vote counts that don't match up, that could stretch things out. And of course, the longer it goes, and they're planning on working through the weekend, the more expensive it is. And it looks like now that only 20% of these uh, costs will be covered by the Stein campaign, unless something changes in court. And we'll talk more about that coming up at 6. All right, Guy, we'll see you then. Kim? All right, now to a developing story. The death toll in the fire that tore through an Oakland, California warehouse now stands at 36 and is still expected to rise. The fire broke out late Friday inside the warehouse known as the Ghost Ship. It was home and working space for dozens of artists, several of whom died in that fire. But as crews continue to search the building, questions remain. Investigators say they're discovering new clues in what's turned into a criminal investigation. We now feel very strongly that we have the section of the building that was the area of origin of where the fire started. Well, now that they've found where it started, investigators will now work to find out the fire's cause. Although it is now clear the buildings, the building rather lacked permits for anyone to live inside it. Consumer investigator Hank Winchester is here with a look at what he's working on next. Hank. Many of you likely out holiday shopping, trying to find the perfect gift for your kids. Well, a local mom has a warning for you. Who needs a Hatchimal? There's Fuzzy Wonder. The item she bought online that she says never came. Her story in a Help Me Hank Consumer Alert, new tonight. All right, Hank, also a historic gift for Henry Ford Hospital. What they received today that will have a huge impact on two deadly types of cancer treatment. Ben? One of our more mild evenings ahead as temperatures remain above freezing all the way until midnight. We'll show you how low the mercury is going to go. Coming up. Today, a doctor in Farmington is charged with assault against an 18-year-old female patient. He denies the charges. Police believe they have evidence that cannot be denied. I've got that for you coming up. New at 6. Some very private opinions go very public with social media, and some people are saying that means one local elected official needs to be out. All right, Paula, also caught on camera, Detroit police need you to be on the lookout for these people, what they did that has police on the hunt. A physician from Farmington facing charges tonight accused of inappropriately touching a teenage patient. Police say Dr. Eliezer Monet tried to kiss the young patient during an examination. Let's get to Steve Garagiola live. And Steve, you actually spoke to his accuser. Yeah, she really wanted to speak out about what she says happened to her. The incident allegedly happened back in June. So I guess the question is why the long delay between then and charges just being filed now? And the answer is DNA test results. Once those results came back, the Oakland County prosecutors decided it was time to move forward. The accused doctor, Eliezer Monet, denies the charge that he inappropriately touched an 18-year-old female patient during an exam. The alleged victim, Samantha Skeen, says Monet tried to kiss her and did actually put his mouth on her neck. He put his hand out to like pull me up. And when he pulled me up, um, he went to kiss me. And out of reflex, I pulled to the side and he kissed my neck. We were able to collect um, a sample of DNA from her neck, some saliva DNA. The Michigan State Police Lab matched the DNA sample to Dr. Monet, and he is charged with assault and battery. Samantha says she doesn't want to be an anonymous victim because women should not feel shame at being victimized. You have to stay strong and you have to understand that there's so many people who are going to say that you're wrong and that they're going to say that that it was your fault. A longtime patient of Dr. Monet's who did not want to be identified says she can't believe these charges could be true. He's just been uh, the best doctor I've ever had. Never has he ever done anything inappropriate. Chief Demers believes the DNA evidence is beyond challenge, and Dr. Monet's accuser believes she's not the only victim. I know that he has done this to other people. I want other people to say, look, this has happened to me, um, and, and let's get him. Now, I do want to emphasize, it is not normally our practice to identify an assault victim, particularly if it's some sort of a sexual assault. 
but Samantha was very clear. She did want to appear on camera because she says it's important to her that other women see there is no shame in being a victim. Devin, Kimberly, back to you. And how strong of that young woman to come forward and, and tell her story. Yeah. Steve, what comes yeah. next in this process? Do we know? Well, yeah, the process really is just beginning at this point. Uh, Dr. Bonet was allowed to post bond. There's a no contact order with the alleged victim. There will be a pretrial uh, third week in January, and then it will move forward into trial. And we know you'll keep us posted. Steve, thanks. Well, if you've been waiting for that little dose of winter, you kind of got, we got a shot of it last yeah, night. I think where you are. Yeah. yeah, appetizer. Yeah. The, uh, we're 16 days away from the official start of winter. Just in case you're you know, I mean, You're obviously. <laughs> you know, you want to <laughs> mark it down at home. Uh, but we're going to start feeling a lot more like it towards the end yeah. of the week. In fact, we're really got some of our warmest air on top of us uh, right now for today and tomorrow. And then things start to change when we head into the middle of the week. So we're in the 30s now with the exception of Sandusky, which is actually our warmest spot right now at 40 degrees. But these upper 30 degree air temperatures, then you factor in a wind, which is not terrible out there, but it's around 10 miles an hour, give or take a couple. And then that puts our wind chill down below freezing in a good portion of the area, especially uh, down here to the southwest. 26, the wind chill in Lansing and Jackson and Adrian at 27 right now. Plenty of moisture down to the south. This is what's heading towards us, even though uh, this is a lot more vigorous than what we expect. They've got a tornado watch out there for parts of the Florida Panhandle. But as that starts advancing to the north, you can already start to see some of the higher clouds getting north of the Ohio Valley. We'll get a little bit of a break tonight in the cloud cover. That's probably not going to help us out temperature wise. But uh, once we get into tomorrow, clouds do start to return, as you'll see here. And then eventually, as we get into the afternoon, that's when we start getting wet. Heaviest rain will stay to the east, uh, but I think just about everybody's going to get something. And then behind the front, that's when the really cold air sets in that we'll have to deal with for the remainder of the seven day forecast. Now, as far as how much rain we're expecting tomorrow, it's going to be noticeable, at least here on the east side. Metro zone numbers 38 one hundredths is what we're expecting here in Dearborn and Detroit. Maybe as much as four tenths down river south zone, especially down here towards Lake Erie. We're looking at close to half an inch of rain, and then those numbers become a little bit less out into parts of Livingston County. Numbers also slacking off the further north you get. So two tenths, one tenth is what what we're expecting in our west zone and north of M59. We're looking at one tenth pretty much across most of the area until you get down here towards M59, maybe two tenths. And it's all liquid, all water, uh, what we're expecting tomorrow. We'll get plenty of chances of seeing some snow coming up. 41 for that high temperature tomorrow as that rain develops again. Most of this in the afternoon, we'll see it start in our south zone. Uh, late in the morning and then look at these high temperatures staying below freezing there on Thursday and Friday. Even though we've got some flakes in the work week, I'm really keeping our eye on Sunday. That looks like our next organized system that's going to roll through here a little early to tell exactly what type of precipitation that's going to be, whether it's going to be a mix or all snow, uh, but we'll uh, keep our eyes on it as we get into Sunday. Eventually it's <laughs> going to be that way. Isn't well, it? yeah, I mean, the Lions are going to win, hopefully. Oh, so we, we don't, we don't care about like that. Yeah. Right. Let's check in with Steve Handelsman in Washington. Steve. Donald Trump tapped Ben Carson for his cabinet. Now Gore comes to see the president elect today. The story, the transition coming up next. And today, the Henry Ford Health System received its largest individual donation ever. From Dr. Frank McGeorge, the touching story behind the gift and the patients who will benefit the most. That's next. Good health today. The Henry Ford Health System received the largest individual gift in its 100 year history. This is a big deal. Dr. Frank McGeorge is here to show us a touching story behind it and the ways it will benefit countless patients. That's exactly right, Devin and Kimberly. You know, $20 million plus a matching gift from the health system will create the Brigida Harris Cancer Pavilion. That's an integral part of the much larger Henry Ford Cancer Institute that's due to break ground soon and expected to open in 2019. Now, all of this is made possible because of one man's enduring love for his wife. It's so cruel to see a loved one dying in front of you, which I did every day for 21 months, and she never complained. Unbelievable person. 96-year-old philanthropist Mort Harris is talking about his wife, Brigida. She died of pancreatic cancer, driving him to help further treatment and one day a cure through the creation of the Brigida Harris Cancer Pavilion. Henry Ford Health System President Wright Lassiter III explains. 
This new cancer project is going to go south of the boulevard, um, directly across from Henry Ford Hospital. It's part of our grand vision of restoring and revitalizing uh, the south of Grand community. It will provide hope um, and care for patients suffering from all forms of cancer. Dr. Stephen Kalkanis is medical director of the new institute. Over the last year, we've really pushed hard with our precision medicine program because the field is only a couple of years old, so we want it to be at the forefront. And then a gift like this today really is the catalyst that puts all of that effort into, into high gear. For patients, they no longer have to leave the city or the state for world-class care for cancer. It'll be offered right here, and we hope to be part of the revitalization of, of this great city. Now, the new Henry Ford Cancer Institute is part of a 300-acre expansion and development initiative that's located south of West Grand Boulevard but north of I-94. The Cancer Institute will cost over $120 million alone. Now, this is the, an area you, you work there at the emergency right. room. This is an area you know really well, and the revitalization piece of this, I think, is something that really excites oh, you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they've taken areas that have been basically neglected and run down, and now they're going to build a new hospital facility there, and all of the surrounding infrastructure so this is really a huge boon to the new center area. You got the queue line not too far from no, there. Right. Be Precisely. It's, it's great. Oh yeah. Great for the city. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. cool, cool. New at 530. A big celebration and parade throughout downtown Detroit today after two high school football teams make history. We'll have that story for you on Local 4. It's an extensive project to fix a portion of I-75 downriver. I'm Everett Casimi. Coming up, we'll tell you how long drivers can expect to see construction here on the Rouge River Bridge and how much it'll cost. I'm Hank Winchester. It is one of the hottest toys out on the market right now, and a local mom thought she bought something very similar, but says she ended up getting scammed. Now she wants you to hear her story before you shop. That story is coming up. Watch we Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5.30 starts now. They are of the hottest holiday toy this year. If you're looking to get a child a Hatchimal, Help Me Hank has an important warning. Hatchimals are, uh, I guess, the hot toy of 2016. A lot of parents trying to get one for their little one, but most stores are sold out of them. And then when something hot happens, you know it's what else happens? How it goes. Imposter. So now imposter Hatchimals are popping up online, and some local parents claim they've been scanned. Our consumer investigator, Hank Winchester, joins us now live tonight. And Hank, parents are spending a lot of money for these toys and now obviously are worried they're getting the real thing. They certainly are, and Karen, as you know, a mother of two young girls, you're going to be out trying to find the hot toy, make sure that the kids are happy this holiday season. The mother you're going to hear from tonight, well, she's one of those moms that just wanted to make Christmas perfect for her two kids, but as you will see, she says she believes she's been scammed. Who needs a Hatchimal? There's Fuzzy Wonders. Karma Jordan, like many moms out there, is busy shopping in search of the perfect holiday toy for her little ones. She thought she found the perfect gift on this website, Fuzzy Wonders. Another mom had stumbled across it and was like, oh my God, everyone, if you can't get the Hatchimal, check these out. Fuzzy Wonders appear similar to Hatchimals, but the big difference, they're apparently still available. Hatchimals hard to find. Karma ordered two Fuzzy Wonders for $99, but she says they never came. Online, she quickly noticed many other parents complaining about either not receiving the toy or the refund. And Karma said reaching customer service was almost impossible. So when you call the Fuzzy Wonders customer service line, this is the message that you hear. Thank you for calling Fuzzy Wonders. Due to increased call volumes, call times may be longer than usual. The problem is every time we called, we couldn't get an actual person on the other end of the line. We weren't able to reach a real person after making several phone calls. The message just keeps on repeating. Karma says Christmas this year will have a different feeling, all because of the fuzzy wonder that turned out to be anything but wonderful for her. Now I'm at $100 and a little bit of that Santa spirit yeah. for my kids is going to be gone. Fuzzy Wonders, who knew? Now, we should tell you, they do have a website. We did send an email also to the customer service email address, no reply. Uh, the mother that you heard in that story, Karma, said that she's been waiting for her refund now uh, for more than a week and has joined an online forum with hundreds of other people from around the country who all have the same complaints.
We're live here tonight in Troy. Hank Winchester, back to you. All right, thank you very much, Hank. Police in Westland need your help tonight finding two women who they say stole a wallet from a nursing home. Take a good look at these two security camera photos. They say these women came into the Four Seasons Nursing Home on Newburgh and then asked for job applications. When the employee went to go get those applications, the women stole the wallet and then walked out. If you have any information on these two, please call Westland Police. Donald Trump's victory tour is making a stop here in Michigan. We've learned he's going to stop in Grand Rapids on Friday. Meanwhile, Detroit native former presidential candidate Dr. Ben Carson was nominated by Donald Trump to be the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Loyalty rewarded when Carson quit the primary contest he endorsed Donald Trump. Steve Handelsman following the developments tonight from the nation's capital. Steve. Devin, like Donald Trump, Ben Carson has no experience here in Washington. If he's confirmed to run HUD, and that's the presumption, he'd get 7,000 employees and a budget of $48 billion. Donald Trump broke the news on Twitter. Ben Carson is brilliant, Trump wrote. VP elect well, Mike Pence. To, we're excited to have Dr. Carson uh, as our uh, intended nominee uh, for uh, housing and urban development. The retired neurosurgeon questions the role of HUD in fighting racial discrimination, and Carson has never run a big organization. Now he tackles Trump's promise to rebuild inner cities and reach out to African Americans. The president-elect's phone call with Taiwan's president still has Washington reeling. Forty years of shunning China's arch enemy ended. Team Obama's upset but powerless. Our policy uh, toward this region of the world expires on January 20th. Former U.S. Ambassador to China John Huntsman said Trump strengthened the U.S. for negotiating with China. What is different this time is you've got a, a businessman who has become president of the United States who understands real leverage and how to find real leverage in that relationship. Huntsman is another former Trump critic like Mitt Romney, whose sources say is under consideration for Secretary of State. Meeting with Trump today was Al Gore, who wants Trump not to back the U.S. out of the global deal to fight climate change. Uh, I, I found it an, an extremely interesting conversation uh, and uh, to be continued. Still avoiding reporters, Donald Trump today warned his tweeting will continue. He'd have less reason to use Twitter if the press would cover him accurately, Trump tweeted today. But he complained, I don't know if that will ever happen. From Washington, Steve Handelsman, Local 4. All right, Steve. Also, a North Carolina man is now charged after police say he walked into a popular pizza restaurant and opened fire over a conspiracy theory involving Hillary Clinton. Police say 28-year-old Edgar Welch walked into the Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria over in Washington, D.C. Sunday and fired a shot into the floor. No one was hurt. Investigators say Welch's belief in an online post that claimed Hillary Clinton and her campaign chair were running a child sex abuse ring in the restaurant that led him to do what he did. The online post was proven to be a hoax. Downriver drivers who commute to Detroit need to get ready for a major construction project that will definitely add a considerable amount of time yeah. to your ride home. Everett Casby has a look at the plans to rebuild the Rouge Bridge and other parts of I-75. It's safe to say that the existing deck here on the Rouge River Bridge is in pretty bad shape. In fact, it's to a point now where patching and repair work just isn't an option to fix it anymore. That's why MDOT is taking on this two-year project. We're actually peeling off the old concrete from the bridges uh, at the Rouge. Uh, we're fixing up the steel, putting down new concrete bridge deck. And then down at Goddard, we're actually taking out two long bridges and building four short, shorter bridges. Starting February of 2016, the Michigan Department of Transportation will start construction on the Detroit Downriver Connection project. It's a $170 million investment to fix a portion of I-75, but once completed, the Bruce Bridge will essentially look the same. Um, hope, uh, hopefully um, they'll see a brand new surface on top and they'll find that to be um, problem free. In total, MDOT plans to improve three large bridges and 13 smaller bridges, along with repairing the road surface on I-75. Southbound I-75 traffic will be detoured during the two-year construction period. Northbound traffic will not. For the safety and mobility concerns that we got from the community, we felt that it was best to uh, close and detour southbound I-75 while we maintain that 75 movement. The detours will add an additional 20 to 25 miles to your southbound commute, taking drivers along I-96 and 275 before getting back onto 75.
But it's, it's, it's freeway if you're taking the freeway over, so hopefully it'll be continually moving as opposed to uh, stop and grow, uh, stop and go traffic. According to MDOT officials, the Rouge River Bridge is the largest bridge in the state of Michigan, built back in 1967. Replacing the bridge deck as opposed to the entire bridge saves a lot of money. Construction is expected to be completed by October of 2018 with incentives for crews to finish earlier. Evrod Kasumi, Local 4. All right, everyone. Today, the entire Detroit School District is celebrating two very big wins. Both Cass Tech and Martin Luther King High School took home state football championships. In fact, it is the first time in history yeah. that Division One and two champions came from the same district. So time to party today. Our Coco McAvoy was there for a parade in their honor. What a big day for Cass Tech and Martin Luther King High School, but also a huge day for the city of Detroit. And as you're about to see, hundreds of people came out to celebrate. It's a historic time for the city of Detroit, so a parade is more than fitting. Cass Tech! The streets were filled with students and fans from Cass Tech High School. Really proud of the football team. They had a really great, phenomenal season. And from Martin Luther King High to celebrate their football team wins that coaches say didn't come easy. Our coach passed, um, you know, that was an unfortunate situation and we just rallied behind that. And right now we've been knocking on that door for 8, 10, 12, 15, 20 years and we're here now. The floats, bands, and dancers marched down Woodward, and all eyes were on them. The interim superintendent for the district, Alicia Merriweather, says a lot went into making this happen. The city of Detroit, Detroit Police Department, the parade company, so many people worked together to pull this parade off. But this event is about more than celebrating the two football teams. I sure hope what it means is that people look at what's happening and get encouraged and have hope that Detroit Public Schools Community District is headed in a new, better direction. A historic moment in a historic city. And students say this is just the beginning. It feels good actually just to know that we're putting on for Detroit and like getting a PSL more exposure. And with this being our last and final year, we love that we're going out with a bang. Just obviously a great day for the city of Detroit and two historic wins. In downtown Detroit, I'm Coco McAvoy, Local 4. Fantastic. Good stuff. A horrifying attack as a home security camera rolls. What well, caught one man completely off guard as he answered the door. Did you ever wonder about playing the Pistons one on one, taking these guys to school? Now you get your chance, although it's a virtual chance. I'll explain how it works coming up. They're a local family with a TV rule that would be a challenge for many people to keep. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge, tomorrow night at 5. The rule, the reward, and the inspiration behind it all. Six. New at 6. A distracted driving crackdown is here in Metro Detroit, and you likely won't even see them. Troopers are looking for people doing more than just texting. But we're also looking to see if you got Netflix on your cell phone and you're watching that feature movie, uh, Facebook. We went on a ride along with state police and we'll tell you what we found. All right, Priya Plus, eating more of this food could be the key to living a long and healthy life. The one food you are going to want to add to your shopping cart, new at 6. Have you ever dreamed of going one on one with your favorite piston player? Well, a company has come up with something extremely close and really close to the real thing. Pretty cool. Steve Garagiola got a first look at a new game experience that puts you right there on the court. So if you're a basketball fan, you've probably thought about how cool it would be to run with the Pistons one on one against these stars. Now you get your chance, a virtual chance. Today, the Pistons unveil one on one with the Pistons, an interactive video game experience which fans can enjoy on a tablet, smartphone or computer. The Royal Oak basketball team gave us a demonstration. Oh, I think I just beat Andre right now. Yeah, now you gotta beat Reggie? Yeah, I'll definitely beat Reggie. The system uses live one on one action. You control the action on offense and defense with a simple swipe on the screen. Are you fast enough to take on Reggie Jackson and Andre Drummond? Yeah. You just gotta be fast on the screen. Uh, they're not that good. You can take him, right? <laughs> of course. No, no, don't use that. To beat these Pistons stars one on one, you have to know their weakness. Maybe defensively. Maybe defensively. <laughs> I think maybe defensively. I, I'm very confident in myself offensively. But uh, nah, defense or no weaknesses? Oh, we got weakness. I just won't tell you. <laughs> he ain't gonna tell you. Take on the Pistons one on one. 
You can find a link to the game at our webpage, clickondetroit.com. So go get them. Are you beatable on this game? Very beatable. <laughs> Very beatable. Really? Yeah. You just got to know how to play. <laughs> <laughs> got to know how to play. I'm Steve Garagiola, Local 4.